Well, how are you today? This is Vic Caralillo coming into your home, into your business right now, asking you for an opportunity to give me 30 minutes that I could share with you about Jesus Christ. Don't shut me off yet. I tell you, I'm going to share Christ with you in such a unique way that you're not even going to get it until the end of the show. And also you say, you know what? That man has something there. You know what I have? Besides God's calling, I have experience. I've been through life. I feel like King David in a lot of ways, uh, the king of Israel, who has been through life, who was tested at all points. His first test starts when he becomes um, by the prophet. The prophet comes to the house and his father, Jesse, has puts the boys out there, seven of them. And the prophet says one of these are going to be the king of Israel. And he's almost ready to make a decision by what he sees with the natural eye. So many of us today, we make decisions on what we see with the natural eye. Some people say, you, this guy looks like somebody that's in it for the money. I'm not in it for the money. I could be doing a lot of better things than beat on TV for the money. But, you know, we take a judgment call by the suit I dress, by the hand gestures. That's what the prophet almost did. He looked at the seven boys and he starts to say, this big guy, good looking guy, he's going to be the prophet, the king of Israel. But all of a sudden he hears the voice of God. Now, you know, you say hear the voice of God. What is this? He didn't hear it here. He heard it in his heart. It says, wait a minute, Jesse. He says, there's another boy you have. He says, I hear it. He says, well, I got a son. He's a little runt. He's out in the field. He, he watches over the sheep, tills the soil. He said, bring that one up front. I could picture it in my mind. This little guy, David, come running up. And now all of a sudden, the prophet said, that's going to be the king of Israel. It's not what Jesse expected. It's not what the brothers expected. It's not what the world expected. You know, some people just believe David came into office. It wasn't a vote. You got to go back and read the story in Samson, the first book of Samson. Read the story and understand. David was called, but in man's eyes, he was like a piece of dirt. He ran and ran from the enemies. He ran from the people that were supposed to select him. His predecessor was Saul. They didn't get along because Saul seen something in David that he didn't like, so he tried to kill him. David never reviled back against Saul, just something to think about. But Saul was an angry man at the anointing that David carried. So David knew what it was to live in the woods for a night. He knew what it was to live without food. He went through it. The king of Israel I'm talking about. The Bible says in the New Testament that Jesus honored David in the things he did. But he said one better than David came. God incarnated by a, the flesh of a man born of a virgin birth where the Holy Spirit implanted the seed, Jesus Christ, comes out of the lineage of David. Now David starts to realize that uh, this war is too much for me to handle. He says, I'm, I'm getting so confused. I don't know who my enemy is. I don't know who my friend is. It's just getting to be too confusing. He starts to go back and work in the camp of the enemies of God. This is the king. David now goes back and starts to get friendly with the enemies of God. He was called to destroy them. He wasn't called to walk with them. But in his confusion, he feels that they, they're accepting him at some level. How many of you, you, you found Jesus Christ? You found God? And all of a sudden, the pressure becomes too much. The Bible talks about this in the parable of the sower. S-O-W-E-R, talks about this. And David starts to really walk this thing out. He goes back. I'm telling you, there are people right now, you listen to me. You've come to Jesus Christ. You've accepted him as Lord and King. But the pressure, the assault against your mind, the separation of man today in the gym told me, he says, you know, Vic, 
I just recently came into Christ. He said, well, you know what my problem is? I said, what's your problem? He said, I lost all my friends. I said, you, you on the right track. God's given you a gift if that's what's happening. Now, that may sound crazy, but the people that were involved with that man at one time, and he walked in a, a cloudy, muddy circumstances. I know him. He said, they don't want to talk to me no more. I said, yeah, because now you're coming in with the truth about Jesus Christ. And the devil now makes an, a, a, a distinction, a line between you and them. And there's a separation. That's God. But David now wants to make like he don't hear that. So he goes back to where he felt he belonged. And I want to tell you that in the going back, he starts to realize it's not so bad over here with these people until these people, the Amalites, said we're going to go and kill and have a war against a certain other set. And he goes down there. But they said, David, you ain't coming with us. He said, the superiors of our captain said, you were once of them. We're afraid you might get that inkling again and come against the thing that we feel that we're going to do. We're not taking no chances. So David, and David's complaining. He says, why? I've been so loyal to you for the last year and a half. I'm not going back. He says, I'm already backslidden. I'm not going back. He says, I'm not going back. And he got so upset that the enemies of God wouldn't accept them. That's God. That was God. They said, go back to you where you were, David. And David starts to put his tail between his legs, starts to cry, and walks back to where he was going to go. And all of a sudden, just listen to this part. This is important. Now David goes back. And when he goes back to Ziklag, his hangout, all of a sudden, he had his wives there. He had his children there. He had all the possessions there. All of a sudden, he arrives, and it, the city is wiped out. My God, what a disaster. Can you imagine, or maybe some of you have been through this. I guess I've been through it to a degree. What you known once before was all of a sudden separated, gone. All of a sudden, great loss has come to your life. And that's what David felt like. These men and the army of men that he had started to cry and started to say, David, what happened here? They realized that everything was gone. You know, some of these, I'm telling you by the spirit of holy Jesus, that you have been through this. Your life has been radically changed. Some of you are listening now. You lost your job, your house, your wife, your kids. You just lost everything. You said, my God, there's no hope for me now. But the Bible says that David encouraged himself in God. Sometimes the only encouragement you can give yourself is reading of the scriptures, understanding that from Genesis to Revelation, at the end, there will be a parting of the waves and you will arrive in a place called paradise. Ah, sometimes you gotta get your scope out and look a little further down the pike and say, you know what? We're gonna make this journey. David starts to say, I can't start to get so depressed. He says, let me do what I'm called to do. And he rustles up the men and they start walking back towards the enemy territory. But they meet an Egyptian along the way. And the Egyptian doesn't belong in this area. And David says, where are you coming from? He says, well, I'm coming from a fierce fight. But those people in, that were fighting, they had no use for me. They left me on the side. This was an enemy of David. David says, would you show me where they are now? He says, if you don't tell my king that I'm submitted to where they, that I told you this, I'll show you where they are. And he brings David and all his men to where these men are all that just won the battle against Ziklag. And now David looks and he sees them there having a party. Sure, they're having a party. 
they got all the possessions of Ziklag and a few other towns. They've got wealth. I could pitch them with their big cigars saying, I think we got over on them now. We're done. And David, as he sees them, he lines up his men and says, now let's go in and destroy them. David walks in there and destroys. The Bible says in one day, he takes these enemies of God down. And the next day, he brings all the possessions back. God will give you the strength if you're going through it. And you're sincerely called of God. I'm not saying you heard it with your ear. You hear it in your heart. God will give you the power to gain back all your possessions that were lost in the warfare. Sometimes there's a warfare when you come to God. God understands it. But I tell you, when I look back through the tunnel of time, God has given me back everything I lost. And believe me, we're in the hour right now where he's even replacing some of the things I thought would never come back. Some of the money that I lent out as a businessman. I believe God now is going to give me the power to destroy my enemy and bring back the the harvest, the wealth of what I lost. I believe he's going to do it for you. Sometimes God relates this story to the harvest of America. Sometimes God maybe put you through some things, but at the same time, he's dealing with situations in your life that you don't even realize you're going through all this pain and struggle. You're saying, why did I wind up like this? And God's saying, wait a minute, I'm working out some things that you don't even realize. I'm working out some things along the sidelines that you have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm doing it without you seeing. You just stay in faith. Ah, the Bible says that he remains faithful to us even when we weren't faithful to him. He still remains faithful to us. You know why? The Bible says if you receive the Holy Spirit, he lives inside you. So now he's remaining faithful, not necessarily to your flesh, but to the spirit that resides inside of you. A little complicated, but get it. So God remains faithful even when you thought he left you. I know there's people right now you're feeling, I've asked God, I go to church, I've done this, I've received the baptismal of the Holy Spirit, but I'm going through such a hard time, preacher. Helps on the way. I'm telling you, I study the scriptures, I've seen the men and women of God go through some terrible things, but I've seen the God that the lover of your soul, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, him that's fairer than 10,000, the Bible says, I've seen him come to your rescue. And all of a sudden, he brings you to a land of milk and honey. And you say, i got to pinch myself. I don't know how I wound up here. Listen to me. I'm right now embarking on having my own TV show. Now, I don't want to put out too much right now. But God's seen it that Hollywood producers would come to me and ask me to play a major role in a TV show. And I said, I, Lord, you want to get the gospel out? And now all of a sudden you're going to raise me up to that status like overnight. Now, I don't want to talk too much because you never know if there's a, run, a monkey wrench in this thing. But so far, we signed a contract. Now I'm just waiting for the next call. To me, that would be worth all the pain that I've been through. To be able to get amongst Hollywood movie producers and be myself, because I gotta be me. I can't be you. And start to witness the gospel with power and demonstration. God knew what he was doing. When he called me, God said, I put something in Victor. That's not ordinary. People say, you know, Vic, you don't remind me of a preacher. That's why some of you have judged me because I don't remind you of what you think a preacher should be or what I should look like. What I sh No, no, I come from a whole different door 
than those doors. I come in a different door. God's given me. I call it the secret agent look. Ah, they don't know who I am. They do a lot of judgment before I come in. Then when I come in, I come in with the bomb of Jesus Christ. And I have a way of persuading people, compelling them, as the Bible says, to believe in Jesus Christ. I've sat down with criminals, hard criminals. If I was named their name now, you'd say, how did you get in to see them? I don't know. I know for years I've worked with the down and outers. I fed them. I went to the soup kitchens. I, now I'm winding up with people that have some sort of stature in society, some level of fear when you talk to them. And I said, God, how did I get here? He said, it was me, son. I said, Lord, but what do I say? He said, look at their faces and be fearless. Tell them that I am the Lord of all. Tell them that someday they have to arrive in a place and answer for their sins. Or you could take the escape route and say, Jesus, please accept me into the beloved. Let me understand who you are when I'm on planet Earth. And if I was to die today, let me wind up in a place called paradise. Make it real to me, Lord. Make it not just a fairy tale. Let it come into my heart that I know that I know that I know that what I've done in the past has been forgiven. And now I go on to walk with you in the future. I believe some people right now, your ear of your heart is being opened. And you're saying, you know what? I never thought about this, Jesus. I never thought about a day of judgment. I've never thought about a day of reconciliation. I thought, you know, when we die, we go into the grave. Well, that's what you thought until you heard me. I come to warn you, there is no grave that you're going to live in forever and your bones. Are, no, no, there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. And I believe today I've come to you with the rights the power, the anointing, and the spirit of revelation that you would accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now listen to this. Let's go back to the story a minute. Now in the, the, I'm in the first book of Samuel. I've been in the 29th, the 30th. Now I'm in the 31st chapter. Just so you have an idea if you want to read this story on your own, which I advise. I think you should read this story on your own. But I want to say this. At the same time, that David is now getting involved in taking back all the spoils and winning the victory. Now, remember I said in the beginning of this story that Saul was after David. And it was his enemy for jealousy for many different reasons. All of a sudden, David hears in the 31st chapter, he hears that Saul was killed. Now think about that. The enemy. David's nowhere near Saul at this point. He hears it while he's in his room. He hears a man comes to him and says, I was there when Saul was killed. He says, how do you know that? He says, I was there. I seen it. Matter of fact, I held the javelin to his body and he said, let me fall on it. So this guy had the knowledge that Saul was dead. Now, there's a whole nother Bible teaching here, but I'm not going there today. I just want you to know this. Get this. That while David was going through the mucky waters, he couldn't pay his rent. He was losing his car, losing his mind, losing his wife. His kids were going wayward. God is dealing with the main enemy of his soul, which was Saul. He's dealing with Saul. And at the same time, David has nothing to do with it. He's nowhere near the situation. God kills, has Saul killed. And now David comes into his kingship. I believe I'm speaking to some kings on the other side. I believe I'm speaking to some people that are called the kings of God. You've been raised up in some wayward situations, but now, God's going to call you a king. He's going to bring you up because you are a son of a king. I believe today, if you would just hear me and even go back and listen to this, I have plenty of these on YouTube. I believe I'm going to inspire you to think a little bit out of the box. No more after you listen to me is it religion as usual. No more is it, do I go to my church on Sunday? I'm bored out of my skull.
I do it because my mother did it, my father did it, my grandparents brought me there. No longer am I going to church for that reason. Now I'm going to find a church where they speak my language, where they understand that my heart cries out for something that I don't see in the place I'm in now. I want to be a part and I want to be effective in what God has called me to. So the search is on right now. God has put a searchlight in your heart. And now from this day forth, you're going to start searching for Jesus. Some of you, you put your searchlight down. You started the search for God. And then you felt you knew it all or something got in the way like David. But I'm telling you right now, put the light back on, start to face it, start to go. The Bible says that our path has a light on it by God. Follow the path that God has put before you. The Bible says you need no man to teach you his word. You need no man teach you his word. He said, I, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things in the word. You know where I learned most of my word? By sitting down with men that knew the word and then reading it on my own and saying, wait a minute, let me go back to that meeting. I got some things that I want to share with. And that's how it works. God builds upon messages that some people speak. There's people listening right now. You've heard this message before. Well, you never heard it the way I said it today. You never heard it because God's teaching me to be relevant with my people that are called by God. He's teaching me to give you something that you could say, wait a minute, I am in a mess. <laughs> I never heard a guy say that at the same time I'm in a mess. God's dealing with the mess, though, even though I don't see it with my natural eye. Some of you are going to come out of limbo and say, you know what, I'm going back. I'm getting back to base with Christ. I, I, man, this made it so much sense today. I cannot go back and hang out with the ones of yesterday that bring me back into doing the wrong things. Now, I'm not saying you're ever going to be perfect. And I'm not saying, you know, we're goody good two shoes. We're aiming for that. But I'm not going back with the friends of yesterday that are going to mock the God that I have my faith in. Now, everybody says they believe in God. And, you know, you ask people, do you believe in God? Well, we believe in God. Then ask them the next question, do you believe in Jesus Christ, that he is God? You lose half of them at that point. Then start telling them that in John 3, 3, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven or to see the kingdom of heaven. I ask you today, have you went that far and asked God to let you see the kingdom of God? Oh, you don't see it so much with the natural eye, but you start to perceive things. There's a wisdom that God's given me in my heart that goes beyond this camera, what you're seeing now. There's a wisdom, an impartation, a discernment that is so deep in me. You know, I was telling somebody a few days ago, I said, Vic, you know, we believe like you do, and we do this and that, and they're reading all the things they do that are good, and I'm saying, we give to this parish and we give to this hospital and, and I was really sitting there wow I'm impressed because they're impressed but honestly God's not looking for your money he owns it all he owns everything now God's looking for your soul God's looking for a friendship God's looking for a love relationship with you somewhere that you could have koinonia fellowship with God that's what God's after. If you tell me or ask me, what is God really looking for? Get ready. You're going to love this. The same thing we're looking for. A family. God was looking for a family that calls him father without giving you any sort of brainwashed concepts, any ideas that you have to do this. You don't have to do it. But when you come to him freely, I'll tell you, he's impressed. God's impressed at that. That's what we're looking to do. A man also recently asked me, he said, if they were to come, he said, they did this in the 40s. They zapped your mind with uh, electric, and it wiped out all your memory. 
But it didn't work too well because it did wipe out everybody's memory. But they couldn't remember anything at that point. They had to start from square one. And I'm taking this from my friend Frank that told me this story in Joe. With this, they asked me, Vic, if that was to happen to you, if somebody was to zap your mind, erase all your memories, how would you get back to the thoughts of Jesus Christ? And at first they had me stumped a second. I said, homola, 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 homola. But all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, wait a minute, Vic. You may not come back to all your earthly recollections, but my spirit dwells in you, son. The Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, resides in you. You're never going to lose your way back to me. Because the Spirit of God lives inside of you. And that's your compass. I want to tell you today, that's a major thing for the people of this world. You may believe in Jesus like you believe in Abe Lincoln. You may believe in Jesus like you believe in George Washington. But if you don't believe in Jesus and have the infilling of the Holy Spirit, you didn't even get to ground base one. You didn't even get there until you have the infilling of the Holy Ghost. You say, how do we get this infilling? I want you to say this prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask today, come on, don't be stubborn. I ask today, accept me into your kingdom. Fill me with your life. Put the searchlight in my heart. Put the searchlight in my eyes that I could see more clearly the things of the Spirit. And now here's the big part. Put your hands on my hands on the TV set right now. Come on. Just do it as an act of faith. Father, fill me with the Holy Ghost and power from Mount High. Fill me as an act of faith and mercy to a child in need of you. Fill me right now. Ah, right across this island, New York State, wherever it's seen right now, I believe the Holy Spirit is impacting your life right now. I believe that you're able to come into this like that. The next thing, find a church that's filled with the Holy Spirit. Find a church where the presence of God is in the room and in the people. Join forces with them. Remember, they're not perfect. They just love the same God. They have the same commitment level as you're going to have. Join forces with them. And remember this. When I come back next time, I promise you I'll have another message for you that's going to touch your heart. But until then, let the peace of God reside over your home, your business, your job, your family, your extended family, and let the blessings of Jesus Christ come your way. And may your eyes be instantaneously open to a kingdom that's not seen with the natural eyes. Have a great day. God bless you. Be back real soon.